So what we're going to talk about today is, is a piece of armor in our current sermon series that God makes available to us to help us make sense of the craziness and, and the difficulty that we face sometimes in our life. So today we're going to continue with our current summer sermon series called Armor. Everybody say Armor. And what we're doing in this series is we're looking at what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus in the book of Ephesians in the New Testament part of our Bible. And he's talking about uh, some, some resources or some tools or some armor that's available to us as Christ followers. And so what I want to tell you today is that today's message is primarily for anybody who has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There's been a moment in your time, in your life, where you have, have said yes to Jesus and you've invited him into your life. You've asked him to forgive you of your sins. You've asked him to, to lead you and guide you as you make your way on this side of eternity through life. And then you've asked him to take you to be with him forever one of these days, uh, either when you die or when he comes back to rule and reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So if you're here today and you're a Christ follower, today is something that I hope that you will lean into. If you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we want you to, to discover something today that will help you to face some of the difficulties and cert uncertainties of life that no doubt you are going to face. And if you've lived any time on this side of, of eternity on planet Earth, uh, you're either coming out of a difficulty or, or tragedy of some sort or some kind of problem in life, you're in the midst of one or you're heading toward one. Because Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. How many of you know that's a true statement, okay? In this world, you will have trouble. But he didn't stop there. He said, but take heart because I have overcome the world. So let's recap a little bit of what we've learned so far in our armor series. In week one, we learned that we're in a battle. How many of you know that life is a battleground and not a playground? Okay. Uh, life is a struggle and we are in a, a battle every single day of our life. And the Bible teaches us that we don't battle against flesh and blood. In other words, our battle is not with each other. We battle against principalities and powers and evil forces in high places, the Bible says. And we learned in week one that we have an enemy. What's his name, class? Satan, okay? Uh, he is the arch enemy of, uh, of God. He is the ruler of what the Bible calls the world, the flesh, and, 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 and life itself, okay? On this side of eternity. This, is, this world is, is his domain, okay? And uh, uh, we have an enemy, and we fight a battle every single day. Uh, in week two, we talked about the belt of truth, and we learned that truth is a person. His name is what? His name is Jesus. He is the, the living son of God who is all powerful, who is all knowing, who is present everywhere at all the time. And truth is a person that we can know. In week three, Trent talked to us about uh, what I call the body armor of righteousness. And the body armor of righteousness symbolizes our right standing with God because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We sang about it a moment ago in that song. And, and when Addie gave that testimony out of the book of Philippians about who Jesus is and what he's done for us, uh, the moment that we said yes to Jesus is the moment that God exchanged our sin nature, our unrighteousness for Jesus' perfect holy nature, for his righteousness. And in that moment, there was this great exchange that took place when God forgave forgave us of our sins, past, present, and future, to remember them no more. And you and I live for the rest of our life on this side of eternity in a right standing with God, not because of how good we are, but because of what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross. I should have got an amen right there, okay? Uh, but but our, 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 our breastplate of righteousness symbolizes our right standing with God because of what Jesus did. And because of our right standing, we can have a right belief. And our right belief, we learn, translates into our right behavior. 
Uh, Last week, we talked about the shoes of peace. And we learned that uh, the good news is great news for everybody. Uh, what's the good news? Again, it's the, uh, the story of Jesus Christ, the God-man, who stepped out of heaven in all of its glory and came to this earth to live as a human being just like you and I. And he proved himself to be the one and only powerful son of God when he laid down his life on a cross and he allowed the Roman soldiers to, to pierce his hands and his feet and his side and literally take his life from him and shed his blood so that you and I could be made right with God. And he was buried in a borrowed tomb for three days, the Bible says. And three days later, he did something that nobody else has ever done, proving once and for all that he was God in the flesh and he defeated death. And he got up out of the grave and he proved that he was God and he proved that he had the power over sin and death and the grave. That's good news for every single one of us because our responsibility as a Christ follower is not only to be at peace with God, but to be at peace with other people in our life. And Jesus Christ in us makes it possible for us to live at peace. And his message is one that we are to take to the ends of the earth so that anybody and everybody can have an opportunity to experience the peace of God. Today we're going to talk about the shield of faith. And uh, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6 primarily. I have some other verses of scripture in just a moment. Uh, but let's look at what the Apostle Paul said in that, in that foundational passage that we've been looking at in the book of Ephesians in chapter number 6. And listen to what he says in verse number 11. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the tactics of the devil. And in verse 13, he says, this is why you must take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. And then in verse 14, he says, stand therefore. And then he lists this armor that we've been talking about. He says, stand therefore with the belt like truth around your waist because truth is what holds everything together in our life. Righteousness like, like armor on our chest and your feet sandaled with the readiness for the gospel of peace. And then here's our armor for today in verse number 16. He says, in every situation, Take the shield of faith, and with it, you will be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. I want you to notice a couple of words in in those few verses. First of all, he talks about, uh, he says, put on the armor of God. And then he says, take up the shield of faith. So let me try to illustrate that for you a little bit to help you understand how valuable uh, this is to our everyday life, okay? Uh, We got any baseball fans in the house? All right, I'm a sports fan. I love the game of baseball. My wife loves baseball. My boys play baseball. Uh, so So I love baseball. So let's think in terms of a baseball player today who's getting ready to go out on the field Uh, to face the opponent, okay? Uh, Before that player ever steps out on the field, he goes into a locker room and he gets his locker open and in that locker is a uniform. So before he ever steps on the field, the first thing he does is he puts on his uniform. He's got a ball cap, he's got a jersey, he's got some baseball pants, he's got some socks, He's got some funky looking socks to go over those socks, whatever you call stirrups is what I call them, all right? Uh, And he's got some cleats or some some shoes for whatever uh, turf that he's gonna be playing on, right? So he's got a uniform that he puts on because he's going out to face an opponent. But as he goes out to face the opponent, there's some additional tools that are available to him depending on what part of the game that he's playing. All right, so as I live my life as a Christ follower, everything we've talked about so far in this series, as it relates to truth, as it relates to righteousness, and as it relates to peace, it's like that uniform that we put on every single day. And it's available to us to be able to go out and live our life and to stand in our faith 
and to face the opponent or to face the enemy. But there's also going to be times in our life where it's necessary for us to have some other tools and some other resources that are disposable, that's our disposal that we're going to be willing to take up or we're going to have to take off, take up at just the right time. So that's where uh, uh, the other tools come in. So for instance, when that baseball player's in the dugout and it's his time in the batting lineup to get up and to go face the pitcher who wants to strike him out, what does he do? He picks up his bat and he takes his bat. Maybe he's got some, uh, some batting gloves and he picks up his bat and he goes to the plate to stand in the plate to face the opponent who's trying to strike him out. He doesn't go in the batter's box with his ball glove, does he? He goes in the batter's box with his, with his ball bat, okay? And depending on how well he does, when he gets back into the dugout and it's time to go out into the field to play another part of the game, he doesn't take his ball bat with him out into play the field. What does he do? He picks up his ball glove because that's the tool that's necessary for that part of the game that he's playing. Well, when it comes to the armor of God, it's the same thing. We put on the armor every day, but depending on the circumstance or situation that we face in life or the tragedy or the trial that we face, there's some additional armor that's available to us. And the shield of faith is like that baseball bat or it's like that ball glove that we have to be willing and ready and able to take up when we need it the most. Does that make sense? If that makes sense, say, uh uh-huh. Okay, so the shield of faith uh, is one of those pieces of armor that we have to be ready, willing, and able to take it up and put it on. Uh, The picture that we've been using of this is this picture right here of a Roman soldier. Uh, This is not 100% completely accurate to the first century Roman soldier, but it gives you a good idea of, of what the armor is like. And I want you to notice the shield. The shield is the largest piece of armor that was available to the soldier. Uh, Most Bible scholars believe that the shield would have been somewhere around two and a half feet wide to about four feet tall. Uh, Some Bible scholars believe it could be as much as six feet tall, depending on the size of the of the uh, uh, of the warrior or the size of the of the soldier. But it's the largest piece of armor that's available uh, to the soldier. Uh, This one looks like it was probably made out of some kind of iron or metal, which have been true to the first century. But many of the Roman soldiers shields were actually made of a of a thick wood. Maybe an acacia wood, which was part of the landscape in that particular day. And it would have been really thick, maybe several inches thick. Excuse me, it would have been about the same size as this. And it would have been wrapped in either a piece of leather or or an animal skin of some sort. And I'll I'll tell you why uh, in just a moment, all right? But but when it comes to the shield that the Roman soldier uh, was, uh, was available to him, Uh, It was so that he could withstand a certain type of onslaught or attack that was coming against him. So let me ask you a question today for all of our Christ followers in the house. Uh, What does a Christian, when does a Christian need to take up his shield of faith? When do we need to take up our shield of faith? And the Apostle Paul answers that in Ephesians 6 and verse number 13. He says there in verse number 13, this is why you must take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. So there's gonna be some things that we face in our life where it's gonna be necessary for us to be willing to pick up the the shield of faith. What we're gonna believe in what we're going to put our trust in, who we're going to, <clears throat> who we're going to believe in and put our, our trust in when the battle is raging. In verse 13, he tells us the day of evil. And the way that I like to describe that is it's the day in our life when all hell breaks loose. Anybody ever had one of those days? I have. It's the day in our life when literally all hell breaks loose and we're under attack mentally. And we can't process information with, uh, with logic and with reason. 
and with clarity. It's the day when our money, uh, when there's more month than there is money. You ever had one of those months? It's the day when money's so tight financially, you don't know how you're going to pay your bills or you're going to put uh, groceries on the table or you're going to put $4.39 gas in your tank. I know because I bought it yesterday. Uh, it's the day, it's the day when, when you show up at work and your boss calls you into your office and says, I hate to give you this news, but um, I got word from corporate that we're downsizing and your position's doing, being done away with and, and you're going to be terminated. It's the day when you walk into your doctor's office after a routine physical and blood work and your doctor says, I've got some bad news. We need to explore some things. It looks like maybe you've got some kind of sickness or disease. It's a day when your kids have said, I'm leaving, I'm done with you, I don't want anything else to do with you, and I don't want to ever see you again, or I don't want to ever hear from you again. I don't know if you've ever had a day like that, but I've had days like that. Uh, when Dr. Murky stood over my bedside on December the 3rd in 2020, said, Mr. Baker, you have coronary artery disease, and it's necessary for me to do open heart surgery on your heart. And I'm going to crack your chest open and break your sternum. And I'm going to take your heart out and stop it for 40 minutes and put you on a machine that'll keep you alive so that I can replumb your heart, is what he said. It, it, it's, it's in those moments of life that we have to have some, some resources and some tools available to us that are going to help us to to stand firm in what we believe and know. And faith is that tool. Faith is that piece of armor that, that helps us to stand up against the uncertainty of life, that helps us look the enemy in, in the eye and say, I am a child of the king. I have Jesus in my life. And greater is he who is in me than you are, bad boy. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it's in the moments when, when all hell breaks loose in our life that we need to know what we believe and why we believe it. And there's our faith that's going to help us to stand. That he uses that word stand twice. He uses it in verse 13 and verse 14. He says, stand, therefore. And it's a, it's a picture in the original language of a battle or a war that's being raged. And we don't have to look too far to imagine that today, do we? All we gotta do is turn on our TV today and we'll see a, a very real war going on in our world today. And the picture that the Apostle Paul uses there in Ephesians chapter six is that when the battle is raging, and the war is being fought, and all hell is breaking loose in your life, that shield of faith and that armor that, make, that God makes available to us uh, is what he will use in our life to help us to stand and to fight the battle. And the beautiful picture is that after the battle's been fought and the war's been raged and the missiles are flying by and the bullets are, are whizzing by at the end of the battle, when the dust settles, we're still standing. That's the picture that the Apostle Paul is painting in Ephesians chapter, ch chapter number six. So listen to some of these, uh, these verses in the New Testament part of our Bible about uh, what the shield of faith is. And the shield of faith very simply is what I call belief in action. It is, it is belief in, in action. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse two, the writer says, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our what? Of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured a cross and despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. That verse tells me that Jesus is the source of my faith. 
And I don't know about you, but it's in those moments of life when all hell breaks loose that I need more than willpower. I need more than determination. I need to know who I am and whose I am and what I believe and why I believe it and the difference that it makes in those moments of crisis. And Jesus, the Bible says, is our source of faith. Galatians 2 verse 20 says, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. This is the Apostle Paul talking again to the church in Galatia. He says, I no longer live because of my relationship with Christ. Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, the life I live on this side of eternity, in my temporary body, he says, I live by faith. In who? In the Son of God, that's Jesus, who loved me and gave himself for me. So not only is Jesus the source of our faith, but I am positioned for victory because of who Jesus is in me. I am positioned for victory because of who Jesus is in me. And then 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4 says, because whatever has been born of God conquers the world. Uh, this is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. Our faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So the key to winning the battle is faith. The key to winning the battle is faith. And faith is a belief in action. Let me give you our bottom line thought for today. If you don't hear anything else I say today, please, please, please. If you are a Christ follower, you need to get this. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, if you will say yes to him, this can be your position as you face the uncertainty and the struggles and trials and difficulties of life, okay? Our bottom line thought for today is that as Christ followers, we don't fight for victory, we fight from victory, Listen, we're no match for the enemy. We have nothing within us that enables us or allows us in and of ourself to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps enough and to stand firm against the enemy who wants to kill, steal, and destroy, the Bible says, our life. But as a Christ follower, again, because of what Jesus has already done, we don't fight for the victory. We fight from the victory because Jesus has already fought the battle and he's already won the war. It's a done deal. It's taken care of. So my position in Christ because of who he is in me allows me to put on that armor that we've talked about in this series and to take up that shield of faith and believe and trust in who I know to be my Lord and my Savior to help me to win the battle and to fight the battle. Let me give you another definition of faith. Faith is simply acting as if God is telling you the truth. It's acting as if God is telling you the truth. Faith is what you do in response to what you believe. Uh, let me give you an a, a ancient illustration of that, then I'm gonna give you a modern illustration. In Luke chapter number five, uh, Jesus is teaching along the Sea of Galilee. And it's during the daytime. His disciples have been out fishing all night long because that's what they did in the ancient world. They fished at night. And they, they pull their boats up on the shore because it's daylight and they're cleaning their nets and they're getting things prepared to go back out to work that night. And Jesus shows up along the Sea of Galilee and the multitudes and the crowds have gathered around and Jesus steps into Simon Peter's boat and he begins to sit down and teach the people who have gathered to hear Jesus. And that's where we pick up the story in Luke chapter five and verse number four. It says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, that's Peter, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Master, Simon replied, we've worked hard all night long and caught nothing. But listen to what he says next. But at your word, I'll let down the nets. And when they did this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. What was Peter doing? Peter was acting on what Jesus said. 
His belief is in what Jesus told him to do. Was Jesus a better fisherman than Peter? Probably not. Peter was a professional fisherman. Did Peter know what he was doing to catch fish? Yes, but Jesus told Peter to do something, and instead of of arguing with Jesus, instead of, yeah, but Jesus, Peter says, but at your word, I'll I'll, I'll do what you, Jesus, I'm going to trust you in this moment, because we didn't catch anything last night. My way didn't work too good. I'm going to trust you. So they push back out in some deep water. They let their nets down. The Bible says they caught more fish than they'd ever caught before, and they needed help to come get them all in. What was Peter doing? Peter's putting feet to his faith. He heard what Jesus told him to do, and he acted based on what he believed Jesus said was going to happen. A modern illustration of this is um, from the world of gymnastics. Uh, My wife is a huge gymnastics fan, and anytime gymnastics comes on, Uh, I have to watch gymnastics because my wife loves them and that's just what husbands do sometimes for their wife. But I I, I love to to hear her help me understand gymnastics because there's a lot about gymnastics that I don't understand. But there's one particular moment in gymnastics history that is branded in my memory even as a casual fan. It was the 1996 Olympics. And there was a young lady on the team named Carrie Strug. Anybody remember the name Carrie Strug? You remember the moment in time? Carrie was known as kind of the the baby of the bunch. She was the one that did not have the reputation of of, of performing well in a in a pressure packed moment. Matter of fact, her coaches would say after her career that many times in her career, uh, they had to treat her with kid gloves and be very, very gentle with her because in a, in a, in a, in a, in a pressure packed moment, she had the reputation of, of caving into the moment and not performing well. And, and in the 1996 Olympics, it was the last day and the last event. It was the vault. And the United States found themselves one position behind the Russians. And they needed to win the vault in order for the United States Olympic team, the women's team, to win the gold medal. And unfortunately, the the gymnast that went just before Carrie, Carrie was the last one to go. And the United States did not anticipate the event being that close. So they didn't think about it when they put Carrie in the last spot. But the gymnast that went just prior to Carrie, on on both of her vaults, she faulted and fell. And the way that the scoring goes in gymnastics is you can only throw one score out. So the United States had to throw out that gymnast score because she didn't score uh, any points. And now the weight of the Olympic moment was on Carrie's shoulders. And it was up to Carrie. She needed a 9.4 or greater to be able to beat the Russians and take the gold medal home. And true to her reputation, she had two chances. And on her first chance, she acknowledged the judges. She started down the runway. She hit the ramp. She hit the vault. She performed her routine. And when she landed, she fell. And she buckled under pressure. And what the world didn't know in that moment is when she fell, she not only sprained her ankle, but she tore ligaments in her ankle. And it was almost immediately as she got back up to go back to the beginning of the runway to do her second vault, it was very noticeable that she was in extreme pain and she was limping and she was fighting back tears because of the pain and the anguish that she was experiencing. And after the fact, she was, she was told to have said to a reporter, it was in that moment that, that I almost walked away because I didn't know if I could uh, walk, let alone run down the runway. But just before she decided to walk away, she heard the voice of her coach. His name was Bella Caroli. And in his broken English, she turned and looked at him. And when she looked at him in his broken English, he said, Carrie, you can do it. Carrie, you can do it. And she turned and looked at her teammates and and they were cheering on and and her teammates were saying, you can do it, Carrie, you can do it, Carrie. 
And instead of walking away and forfeiting her last turn, she set her heart and her mind on the vault. She started down the runway, wide open, full speed, hit the ramp, hit the vault, did a perfect routine and landed and kept her foot down long enough to get better than a 9.4 in the United States won the gold medal. If you remember the moment, she collapsed as she landed in pain and anguish and, and agony. And, and her coach, Bella, came and picked her up and carried her off the, off the platform that day. And they actually carried her to receive her gold medal in a big splint and a bandage because of the damage that was done to, to under her foot. And after that moment of winning the gold medal for the United States, the reporter asked Carrie, Carrie, how were you able to, um, to dig deep and to face that moment? And she said, it was very simple. She said, when I heard the voice of my coach and my coach said, Carrie, you can do it. She said, there was no question in my mind that I could do it. And you know what, church, sometimes... We've got to listen to the voice of our coach. And we've got to believe when Jesus says we have everything that we need to stand firm in our faith against the attack of the enemy. That's exactly what he means. We have every tool and piece of armor that is available to us. We have truth. We have peace. We have righteousness. We, we have faith. That, that helps us to fight the battle and to stand firm in our faith. We don't have time to go there, but in Hebrews chapter number 11, matter of fact, this is in your spiritual growth challenge. I would encourage you to pick one up or download it online and read Hebrews chapter 11 sometimes, sometime this week. Another illustration of putting feet to our faith is, is many people listed in Hebrews chapter 11. It's what we call God's hall of faith. And these people were so full of faith and believed the promises of God that they, they acted on what he said. Uh, for instance, the Bible says, by faith, Abel went out into the field and he gathered some groceries out of, the, out of the harvest that he had planted and he presented them to God as a sacrifice. And the Bible says that he offered that sacrifice and God accepted his sacrifice. The Bible says, by faith, Noah, when God said, Noah, I want you to build an ark because I'm going to destroy the earth. And it's going to rain. And, and the only people that are going to survive are you and your family who are inside that ark. You know what Noah did? He believed what God said. And he went and got his tool belt and he started building a boat. The Bible also says, by faith, Abraham believed when God said, Abraham, I want you to take your only son, Isaac. Take him up on the mountain. I want you to sacrifice him to me. And Abraham packed the donkey, packed the wood, got the fire and, and, and bound his son, climbed the mountain and he bound his son and he drew the knife. And in that moment, God stepped in. And he said, Abraham, I know you now believe that my promises are true. By faith, Rahab in Hebrews chapter 11, Rahab was a prostitute in the city of Jericho. And when the Israelites crossed the Jordan River and they were about to go occupy the land that God had given to them, they were gonna destroy the city of Jericho. But by faith, Rahab uh, opened her home to the spies when they came to scout out the land. And she showed favor on them because she had heard about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Bible says by faith, Rahab uh, protected those spies. And as a result, God spared her and her family when the Israelites came in to destroy the city of Jericho. Faith is this right here. Let me give you a little acronym for faith. F-A-I-T-H. Faith is fully anticipating it to happen. Fully anticipating it to happen. Listen, church, this is not hard for us. We do this on a regular basis, okay? When you came into this room today and you sat down on that bench you're sitting at, I didn't see anybody do a, a 360 inspection of that bench making sure it holds you up when you sat down. You just sat down, didn't you, and occupied that space. When you got in your car this morning, you put the key in your car, you turned the key fully anticipating that it was gonna crank. And you exercised the measure of faith that it was going to happen. If you've ever gotten on an airplane, uh, I've never been able to interview the pilot that, that flies any plane I've ever been on. 
Okay, what do I do? I check my bags, I get on the plane, and I fully anticipate that that plane is going to get me from point A to point B. So exercising faith is not something that's beyond us. It's not hard to do. It's not this mystical thing that's too big for us. It's simply believing in whose we are and what he says about life and putting feet to our faith and standing firm against what comes our way. So what battle are you fighting today that requires faith? What is it that the enemy is attacking you with today that requires you to take up the shield of faith and put on the armor that's available to you? Ephesians 6 and verse 16 says, and with it, talking about the shield of faith, you will be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. What are the flaming arrows of the evil one? Their doubts, their fears, their worries, their temptations, their accusations, their lies, their negative thoughts, it's lust, it's envy, it's strife, it's conflict, it's disappointment, it's pain of all kinds. And the shield of faith is necessary for us to extinguish the flames of the enemy. Remember I told you the Roman soldier's shield would have been wrapped in either a uh, 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 the hide of an animal or a piece of leather, but before that would have been done, they would have dipped it in, in water and soaked it. Then they would put it around the shield so that when the flaming arts of the enemy were coming, they would hit that, that wet leather or that wet, that, that, that wet animal skin and they would immediately be extinguished. That's the picture that the Apostle Paul is painting for us about the power uh, of the shield of faith that is available to us in our life. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says this, since the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but are powerful through the demo demolition of strongholds. Faith is a, is a tool that is powerful to extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy. And I don't know what you're facing today, but if you're a Christ follower, faith is that, is that protection that we have to be willing to take up. And we place our faith and trust in what Jesus has said about our circumstance and our situation. And he'll provide a way out. He'll provide a way through and he'll give us the victory. We're gonna close a little bit differently today. I wanna give you just a moment to uh, maybe talk to God about whatever it is that you need the faith to stand firm against today in your life. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And just for the next few moments, um, in the quietness of this, this moment, just talk to God about whatever it is um, that you need the faith to stand firm in in your life today. And I want you to Ask God to give you the courage to take it up and to go out this week and let's armor up and let's stand firm in our faith and let's demolish the strongholds in our life. As we continue to pray, um, when you finish, I just want to invite you to stand to your feet. I want to ask you to stand to your feet and just look up at me. And we're going to pray one more prayer together. You know, I think prayer is something that we need to get better at as the body of Christ. And we're going to talk about that in just a few weeks because that's a piece of armor that God makes available to us today. Uh, so in the quietness of this moment, can I just invite you to stand to your feet and look up at me for just a moment? Uh, we're going to put a prayer on the screen that I've written today. This is how we're going to close our service. And this is a prayer that I want to encourage you to take with you this week. And pray it every single day. Pray it multiple times a day if you need to. It's on your spiritual growth challenge. You can snap a picture of the screen here in a moment. But as we close together today, let's, let's pray this prayer together corporately. Because it will be helpful to us as we go out. And as we face the world and as we face the enemy. So on the count of three, let's read this together out loud. 
uh, with courage and conviction. Here we go. One, two, three. Heavenly Father, I depend on your Holy Spirit to help me fight and win the battle with my enemy, Satan. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. But you have already won. And I thank you that you have given me the divine power to demolish strongholds in my life. And I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, that I may be a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Take that prayer with you this week. Stand firm in your faith and fight the battle against the enemy. And I promise, based on the authority of Jesus Christ himself, you'll win the victory because the battle's his. Just before you leave, there's one more thing I want to draw your attention to. On, on your seat around you is a, is a card that has some information about our small groups. And we're right in uh, uh, the middle of signing up for small groups. And if you're not connected in a small groups, let me encourage you uh, to check that out because it will add a tremendous amount of value to your life. And we've got some volunteers out at our group center today who would be glad to help you explore some of that. Uh, you can go to our website and fill out a form and we'll be glad to get in touch with you about how uh, you can maybe get connected in one of our small groups that will be launching here um, in the next few weeks, okay? I hope you have a great day, a great week, and I'll see you next Sunday. You are dismissed.